I haven't done that in a while. You did it last week. I did? Yeah. I don't have a good memory. <laughs> good thing I do. <laughs> so this week we're going to talk about the same thing we did last week. No, I'm just no, kidding. No. <laughs> so welcome to Ordinary Life, which is an educational offering by St. Paul's United Methodist Church. And we start with the good news, and that is that we have a date for our regathering process. We will begin together in person in Ordinary Life the first Sunday in June. That's the date. And we have... A plan, kind we of. We are working on a plan. We're working on a plan. You will get all the details of that plan so that you're prepared and we're prepared and we're keeping in mind just the whole safety and inclusion of the whole group. And we're going to follow the same protocols as the church. Pretty much. We're going to handle registration ourselves, meaning that somebody in our class has volunteered to do that. And we'll tell you, all the people who are players in this as we go along. And it will be a work in progress. So we'll probably start with a small number, and um, then we'll work our way up from there. The, I think... i got to keep you in check, man. Huh? I said, i got to keep you in check. Why? <laughs> Because we're still working on a plan. <laughs> we are working on a plan. We have a date. But I just wanted people to know that it's a work in progress. Yes. There are a lot of logistics to deal with. Yeah. You know, you go to the church's website or to the Ordinary Life website, and you find a wealth of material uh, that supplements this. You'll find something about our podcast. Yep. We have a podcast called In Between. If you've been listening along with us these Sundays, you know that already, but um, we do it weekly. It comes out on Thursday mornings, and it's usually between us <laughs> and talking through the ideas that we work through on Sundays, but occasionally we also have guests, and um, it's it's been fun. It's been a way to keep connected. And if you're so inclined, I'm going to pass the plate. Mm -hmm. I don't All know right. how to do that. Oh, well, I'll you pass, pass it, it to, to me. You. There's a Shipley's donut. Where's the donut? I think it's There's been a, eaten. Okay, well. I had a kolache, <laughs> thanks to John. I, well, I want one. What do I have to do to get in on that? <laughs> Ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks as always to uh, Olivia and William and uh, John and Tim for being on the other side of the camera and making it possible that this uh, comes out to you. I hope the time that you spend um, here today is worth it for you. Uh, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount and have been taking a deep dive into um, the Lord's Prayer. So I want you to know that no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. You know, for a couple of years now, we have been um, working under the general title of li living our lives between the no longer and the not yet. And when I first came up with this and took this direction, I was influenced by what I've come to call, because of Holly, evolutionary cosmology. Of course, there, I called it initially the new, the new cosmology, yeah. but there's nothing new about it. <laughs> it's just the newness that comes with our own ongoing um, understanding of the process of evolution. And so we've been involved in a process of deconstruction, and we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and doing this. We're going with the best interdisciplinary wisdom of our time, uh, the book that you saw, if you saw the announcement slides that I'm advocating reading right now, <clears throat> is Doing Theology in an Evolutionary Way. It's a new book by Daramut Amirku, and I really highly recommend it. Because you'll see him and us reworking the tradition, but we're, we're working, reworking it in a much older way than just the origins of Christianity. Too much of our tradition, in my opinion, has been focused on clinging to rather than passing on. And my concern is, how can we best pass on the tradition in a way that honors the evolutionary thrust of a picture of reality that is much bigger than any of us can imagine? We have inherited some things that are ultimately not useful in encouraging us to ask the right questions in moving forward. From the church side, 
we have inherited a momentum towards certitude. And from the academy, we have inherited a fascination with a rationality that stops short of communal engagement. Our primary focus, both in terms of context and content, must focus more on being connected than on being correct. In summary, what I'm trying to say is that creatively surviving this in-between time means doing the work of acquiring and inhabiting this much larger picture that evolutionary cosmology gives us. So the more that I personally have worked with the tradition and the more that I have come to understand the insights of evolutionary cosmology, the more that I am convinced that Jesus had a vision which his followers embraced and enlarged upon of a widely and wildly inclusive community of people who were grounded both in love and in truth. Now, of course, that movement got replaced with an institutional fortress that became dedicated to being correct and keeping dissenters out. It did that with fear-based teachings about a judgmental God. And I said last week, and if you missed that, you can go back and read this in the archives and watch that time from last week, that the most successful piece of bad theology ever written has convinced many people that God is an angry deity out there somewhere just waiting to pounce on us. This God needs to be feared. And this has caused people not only to live with fear and guilt, but to stay in a perpetual state of both codependency and immaturity. And what we're trying to do is to grow into being adult and responsible Christians. So if you want today's class in a sentence, here it is. This spiritual work is not about some ultimate truth. It's not about finding ways to stay safe. It's not about finding a path of ease or keeping from being hurt. It is about love. And in love, there is nothing to fear. We work to train our hearts to love and to grow this experience of love by caring for each other. So one rendition of the line in the Lord's Prayer that we're up to today is this. Untie the tangled threads of destiny that bind me as I release others from the entanglements of past mistakes. So I think we're done. You went from what we're talking about. You said in summary, and if I could wrap up this class in a sentence or two. That's it. Good class. You want to go home now? <laughs> we'll just drink coffee and have kolaches. Um, anyhow, I, I, I really, um, I love thinking about this in the framework of cosmology, and I just sent you an article with the title, Has Science Rendered Philosophy and Religion Unnecessary? Because in the subtitle, it's something that Phil sent me, and, it, and it, the subtitle is something along the lines of science is, is okay with discomfort. And I think what we're trying to do here is say that, hang on, religion too should be un okay with discomfort. Well, what, what I said last Sunday, what we said last Sunday is that one of the three things that constitutes the arena in which we're doing this theology is um, the scientific methodology, which is all about doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's funny too, I mean, now we're on another track, but the, the idea about love, there is no fear in love. To push that a little bit further, love helps us grapple with the fear. Mm -hmm. And so there's fear there, but love sustains. So before getting into the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> before getting into what I was getting to, we already went off track, I'll speak a little bit about cosmology and what some, as you have said, called the new cosmology. And it's not new. Um, it's, you know, approximately 14 billion years old. It's just that humans have been working their way through how to talk about it and understand it. And sometimes, I think when the pressures of the world feel too much or too constrictive, it can help to zoom way out and sort of look at the big picture, to look at things from a bird's eye view or from a, a sort of Hubble telescope view, if you will. Ancient civilizations have always had cosmologies or ways to understand origins and their place in something so vast and so unknown. 
There are two deep strains of cosmology, the scientific and the philosophical. The scientific strain gives us some sense of the physical origins, origins of the universe, its evolution, how black holes might work, theoretical physics, expansion, all of the things that have formulas and theorems and things that I could never come up with on my own. So this branch deals with that, the science. The second is the philosophical branch of cosmology. And this strain is even twofold. First, it's a, about what in the heck humans might mean in this expansive, ongoing, infinite universe. And second, it's about stories. What stories will we tell the universe about us? And what stories will mark the human place in it? I'm fascinated by the science. It's incredible, it's awe-inspiring, it is certainly worthy of shaking us up and asking the questions, and we should continue to question science or else we're doing it a disservice. You've said this before, scientism can become like fundamentalism if we don't question either of these things. Mm -hmm. We push both religion and philo philosophy and science into being better with our questions. So I'm involved in the stories. This is the, the strain of cosmology that I um, relate to, understand, and can maybe make theories about better than the science. I'm interested in the human element. We have 118 elements right now in the periodic table, and they're still ongoing, being developed and being discovered. Some have been found as recently as this century. I want to say that the book my son said the most recent one was 2009. I could be wrong. Caleb, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but some of these have a half-life that are so short that they become impossible to study. But they're out there and they leave just enough of a trace to recognize their existence. I've mentioned before that my oldest son once asked me, and I, this is a question I'm still grappling with or I wouldn't keep mentioning it. He asked, Mommy, what is the human element? I so wanted to be able to say it is love. And that might still be the best answer. And love, as we know, is many things. It can be light, like helium, it can be heavy, like mercury. It can have a high boiling point or a tendency to combust. It can be radioactive, like uranium, or it can be lustrous, like gold. In essence, it can be well-formed, deep, and mature, and it can also be nascent and immature. I bet each one of us has a story about the first time we fell in love, as well as the first time we fell out of love, or the first time someone fell out of love with us. Both are about love, two totally different stories. So love, too, is a story or an evolution, a part of the evolutionary cosmos. What is the human element? I suppose it is, in part, to even be able to conceive of ourselves and to try to put words to that experience. To struggle, as I like to say often, as Jacob did with the angel, and with God, with what is good, with what love even means. My more and more frequent muse, James Baldwin. Ah, there he is. I forgot to put that picture up. That's my son asking, what is the human element? I love that picture of the sun glowing behind his head. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what is the largest human element is carbon. And that we could not, we could not be here without the sun. We are, in effect, sun creatures. So James Baldwin wrote of love. I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. Love is not a feeling, but a power that transforms us and those with whom we interact. For sure, a transformative love is the kind of love that Jesus spoke of, one that would change our hearts, not just about God, but about each other too. And a transformative love is what is needed if we are able to untie the tangled threads of destiny that bind us. This is a shoe with a knot. <laughs> this is what we're working through. The practice of love is the practice of freedom, freedom in all its forms political, economic, psychological, and spiritual, 
And all of these have been used to deny freedoms to certain people and uphold them for others as well. We are entangled, tied in the most complex knot. And any of you who have ever untangled your children's shoes that look about like this know just how tough it will be to untangle the knot we're in, too. So the original, we think, line in the Lord's Prayer was about money. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Someone has said that the majority of the teachings of Jesus can be divided into two categories. One is about forgiveness and the other is about material things in one way or another. And um, several of Jesus' parables were about this whole business of forgiveness of debts. Probably one of the, the most famous um, of the parables in this category is the story about a man who owed his master, a slave who owed his master a lot of money. As a matter of fact, when you figure out how much money he owed him, it's gargantuan. Jesus was telling the story and he just made it a hyperbole, just exaggerated over, over the top. There was no way this man could have paid back the debt. And the master forgave him the debt, just wiped it off. And then this person who had just been forgiven goes out onto the street and runs into a fellow slave who owes him a pittance and he demands that his fellow slave pay him back and he can't do it so he has him put into prison. What? That makes no sense. How can you pay some in debtor's prison makes no sense to me. <laughs> How can you pay somebody back money if you're in prison? So any observer of the economic scene in this country can see that the gap between the have and the have-nots is growing at an almost exponential rate. And economic inequality has gotten worse during the pandemic, and it is intricately connected to other pressing social issues. So during the time that Jesus was doing his teaching, there were these terrifying cycles of indebtedness. It was a fact of life. And this line in the prayer addressed this critical socioeconomic problem by saying, forgive us our debts to the extent that we forgive those indebted to us. Uh, now, I'm, I'm just going to say again, this prayer seeks not only forgiveness of debts, but it commits the one who prayed it to write off whatever anyone owed to them. In the, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is quoted as saying, If you have money, don't lend it at interest. Rather, give it to someone from whom you won't get it back. Now, just a reminder, and I do this because of my commitment to religious literacy, one of the ways that Jesus taught was by praying in public. And after his execution and the resurrection experiences, a community of his followers began to put together what the scholars talk, call a database of his sayings. Um, the earliest of these is referred to by the scholars as the Q document, which we don't have. We just hypothesize that it exists. Then the next one that we have is the Gospel of Thomas, which is not a narrative, but just a collection of sayings. And they put together, these early followers, these sentences, and some of them made narratives out of them, told a story because they wanted to pass it on. And the meanings of the single sentences Jesus used were not only taken out of context, but they were generalized. So it was that this sentence prayer made a gradual transition. They put several sentences together to make a prayer, which reminded them of Jesus, kept them in touch with his memory, kept alive his teachings. And over a long period of time, this sentence, forgive us our debts, became transformed into the forgiveness of sin. Originally, uh oh, it was about a very serious social problem. And 
a clever way that Jesus had of trying to engage the people around him and move them into a new and different level about their own personal responsibility in dealing with this social problem of indebtedness was by having this prayer. Now, in our deconstructing and reworking of the tradition, I can say that this prayer is about a deep and profound willingness to let go. It is easy for me to see how within just a few years, this line about financial indebtedness was expanded to include other lines like the one that we use from Neil Douglas Klotz in his book on uh, the prayers of Jesus, Untie the Tangled Threads of Destiny That Bind Me as I Release Others from the Entanglement of Past Mistakes. <clears throat> now, I've been thinking this past week about the video that has just been released of Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Caron Nazario, who was stopped by two police men in Virginia. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's very disturbing. And though this happened in January, the video has just been released. And this happened at about the same time we learned of Dante Wright's murder at the hands of police just a few miles from where Derek Chauvin's trial is taking place. And I think I mentioned to you that in the New York Times this morning, front page headline indicated that since the beginning of the Derek Chauvin trial, 62 people have been shot and killed by police, almost three a day. Now, it's too high of a number. My question is, my wonderment is, how can all the players involved in these tragic events find release? How can they be set free from the tangled, entangled fates and destinies that are sapping the strength from us and which are so disheartening? We seem as a culture to have lost our way. What can we do? How can we find that which renews and refreshes our trust in each other, our faith in each other, and feeling safe with each other? Mm. We place a huge importance on safety, and yet we've got some sort of backwards way of making us feel safe with more weapons, more violence. These things don't make me feel safe. You said something in our podcast this week about living as if. Um, It might be fun to explore what an as if theology could be without letting it get in the way of seeing the hard truth of what is. So as if lets us lean into hope. What is lets us lean into reality. I got that from John Tucker. Well, he's so brilliant. Yeah. (laughs) Um, There are so many tensions to hold. So living as if there is love at the heart of the universe, facing what is so that we may better live into the ways that we are tangled together, the ways that we're, as Martin Luther King says, tied into a single garment of destiny. This whole year has been a smack in the face, and I'm talking about the last 365 days, not just since January, 365 plus days. And it's much longer, deeper, and more complex than the last year. But as we know, this year has given us a certain set of circumstances to sit with and to be with that pushes us to face the discomfort. There have been some very high profile and public abuses of power, highest level of government, as well as on the streets, as Bill said, between police and mostly black men. I know that there are some of us who either don't want to talk about it anymore or feel so heavy about it but don't know what to do. We certainly cannot change what has happened. There is no going backwards. But I think these types of horrific events give us an opportunity to look at how our whole history has brought us here. The story of our history has landed us here. Whatever you believe about the dynamics of the deaths and abuses um, that we've been public witnesses to, 
Our culture has a problem with power and violence. If we are willing, we can observe this truthfully and still allow ourselves to imagine how we might do things differently. This is the difference, as Bill has described, between destiny and fate. And I'm really borrowing that a lot. I, I really appreciate this, this definition. Destiny is past. Fate is future. We choose our fate by the choices we make, whether to be with what is, whether we choose strength over power, collective liberation over personal freedom, love or hate. We choose our fate every single day, and what we choose becomes our destiny. Jesus was about fate, but not in the way that we think. We've disrupted in here any notions of substitutionary atonement and personal salvation. No one is coming to save us. It is just us. Comedian Richard Pryor once joked about jails. You go down there looking for justice, and that's what you'll find. It's just us. He meant black men. His comedy was a long-standing commentary on the terror inflicted on the black body. But this is not a problem that must be solved by those who have been historically marginalized or othered. This is a problem that must be solved by us, just us, meaning white folks who have sustained power in this country for so long. We who are mostly uncomfortable with racism and all the ways it knots us up, and we often don't see it as our issue, but it is our issue. This is a way that we are tangled up, and we got to untie it. As long as we deny it, look away, or stop struggling with it, we're not acting from a place of love. But I want you to hear this, and I sound like a preacher when I say that. Hear this, congregation. The practice of love is the path toward freedom. It is the only way. And it is the way that Jesus taught. So I want to uh, speak a smidgen about the title of this talk. Actually, I gave it two titles. <laughs> the Imperative cha of Change Without Violence. We live in a violent culture. We're addicted to violence. And um, I think that addiction is because we suffer from Spiritual attention deficit disorder. We forget what we, we forget who we are, and we forget um, what we are about. So, let me start by raising a question: Did Jesus desire to create a formal institutional church in His name? And I think the answer to that is: It is highly unlikely that He did. What Jesus worked to do to create through the apostolic movement, and just so you know, a disciple is somebody who decides to follow Jesus. An apostle is somebody Jesus sends out to carry out his mission. And I've heard John Dominic Cross, and actually he said it in this very space when he was here a number of years ago, say the difference between John the Baptist and Jesus was that um, John the Baptist had a sole proprietor in enterprise, and Jesus created a franchise by sending out the people in the way that he did. So the first hundred years of the Jesus movement, this is what came into being, a small, vibrant, empowering series of communities. The communities were fluid and flexible, you can get a sense of what these communities were about by reading the first few chapters of the book of Acts. These communities exhibit a, a, a sense of power and empowerment from the center. They existed primarily to give power to those who were at the bottom, to those who were marginalized, to the poor. These communities marked a significant shift from the culture of patriarchal domination that existed at the time. They were egalitarian communities. They were anti-imperial communities. They were led largely by women, which that got pushed out of the way pretty early. They were also communities of joy and hope and love and forgiveness. This is why they grew. This is why people were attracted to them. 
And this may have been the future of the movement had it not been for Constantine making the movement the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century. And when that happened, the leaders of the movement began to be shaped by what they saw in the Roman government about them. And they, they gave the movement every trapping of royalty and exclusivity. They even gave that, uh, they reshaped the identity of Jesus in, in that image. And so the movement got distracted, spiritual distraction disorder. It got distracted from its original thrust, its original intent and movement. For example, up until the time of Constantine, it would have been unthinkable for any member of a Jesus community to take up arms. That's why they were persecuted, because they wouldn't give that kind of loyalty to Caesar. There's no doubt in any scholar's mind that at the beginning of the movement, it was nonviolent. And though the word had not been invented yet, that had to wait till the 19th century, it was a pacifist movement. But after Constantine, church leaders, August, Augustine among them, began crafting documents on what constituted a just war. Now, if you get and read the book that I mentioned last week by Nick Page, A Nearly Infallible History of Christianity, you'll laugh a lot. But you will see how politically compromised and corrupted the Christian movement has been across the centuries. To be sure, there were and are pockets that did not and do not succumb to this. But these people in places have not been people of power. And the next time we meet, um, I think I'm going to talk some about the decline of religion in American culture. And the reason that it's declining is because what many people see going on in the religion in America, American culture, it turns them off. It's not attractive. So I woke up Friday morning, like you did, to uh, news of another mass shooting in this country. I, it's heartbreaking. I want to read to you something that Nicholas Kristof wrote that was published in the New York Times. I like Nicholas Kristof. I'm envious of his voice, too. <laughs> He's got a great voice. I can't, I can't hear it in my head. <laughs> Here's what he wrote. This is hard to take in. More Americans have died from guns just since 1975, including suicides, murders, and accidents. More than 1.5 million people. That's more than in all the wars in the United States history dating back to the Revolutionary War. About 1.4 million in wars, 1.5 million since 1975. Mm. No one is spared. In a typical year, more children from infancy through four years of age are fatally shot in the United States, about 80 a year, than police officers, about fewer than 50. When Europeans lose their tempers, they punch someone. Americans pull out a handgun. Foreigners express road rage by cursing. A driver in North Carolina recently expressed his by firing shots into another car, killing a mother of six. That's the end of Christoph. I checked. Gun sales broke an all-time record in March. According to FBI statistics on back background checks, the Bureau conducted 4,691,738 checks that's up from the prior record set in January, just mm. two months before, by over 300,000 in just 60 days. Gun sellers cite stimulus checks and the threat of gun safety legislation after more mass shootings as being the drivers behind this boom in sales. And now heaven help us. Mm. 
our Texas legislature has approved a gun bill that will allow Texans to be able to openly carry handguns in public places without a license, without training. It is called the constitutional carry law. So you wouldn't have to hold a permit, wouldn't have to attend a training class. And here's what the lawmaker who introduced this bill said. This bill should be called the common sense carry because this law is about common, law-abiding citizens being able to carry commonly owned handguns in common public places for the common reason of personal and family protection. Ugh. I feel safer already. That makes my stomach hurt. And when I think about who is at risk when the public carries guns, it terrifies me. You know, my beautiful bride says, we watch TV and we will see something on the news. Some stupid thing is said or done and it just inevitably turns out to be a Texan. It's just <laughs> always from Texas. It's, this is embarrassing. We don't have a good rep for being the most common sense oriented people. <laughs> the, the story behind this says this, this Contain, continues and bolsters Texas reputation oh, sure. as a wild west wild kind of do it yourself sort of whatever. If I and, walked yeah. into a store and somebody was openly carrying a I'd weapon, right I'd turn out. around and walk mm -hmm. right back out. Heck yes. There, I mean, to me, this is just terrifying. Um, I won't even get into all the reasons why, but I think if you've heard me speaking here, you can imagine why some of those things, why that scares me for my kids, for my husband, for me. We're in this liminal space, in the in-between. We are writing the script to our story. We're untangling the knots. So what then is the introduction we need to this part of the story? Einstein is quoted as saying, the most important decision we make is whether we believe we live in a friendly or hostile universe. I'm going to be so bold <laughs> as to correct Einstein. Sorry, sir, all due respect. But I think the universe is both. It is friendly and it is hostile. It just is. The Earth supports our life, but if we lived on Mars, it would be hostile to our survival. We see friendly and hostile events take place all the time between humans. What Bill was just talking about. This breeds hostility. It does not breed friendliness. We are elements of this universe, able to murder and able to love. So the most important decision we will make, I think, is not whether it's friendly or hostile, but how do we live into those binaries. How will we situate ourselves in the universe? Are we choosing to act from friendliness or are we choosing to act from hostility? This is how we determine our fate. So I think a rewrite is needed. And you know if you're a writer or a creative person of any kind, you are always revisiting and recrafting and re-editing, sometimes cutting out whole parts or starting over entirely on the pieces you do. So again, a cosmological question. What is the story we want to leave about the human element in this universe? So um, the story that I just shared about the new law in Texas, about the constitutional carry law, does that reflect that we're devolving? It certainly reflects that we are regressive differentiating on a huge level. And when differentiation happens, separation happens, it's like molecules sort of go back to their own spaces. And then a rejoining happens inevitably, right? Mm -hmm. Because we figure out how those complex, how complexities go together. But what the other thing that can happen in differentiation is chaos. Mm. So, 
It's an imperative, isn't it, that we participate with evolution? That's an imperative. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So that, and there's the thought that humans have the conscious, the consciousness to direct evolution. That's one thought. Why this might be called the Anthropocene era. Humans are directing evolution. I haven't finished reading his book about doing theology in an evolutionary way, but I'm convinced that we have to do theology in an evolutionary <laughs> way. We have to live in an evolutionary way. And, and evolutionary cosmology isn't changing anything about the cosmos. It's changing our awareness about the context in which we live and, and who we are. Mm -hmm. And that we, we're evolving right now as we're, as, as we're sitting here. It's causing those of us who embrace evolutionary cosmology to see things in a different way. We're looking at the same data, but the data looks different because of the way we are looking at it. And that's what I hope you see when you are observing us do this work on Sunday, that we're looking at the Christian tradition through a different set of lens from different perspectives. The, the form of Christianity that most of us are familiar with um, is something that did not exist 300 years ago. People, when they talk about old-time religion, are really talking about something that doesn't go back to Jesus' time. Um, the, um, the, religion that it, the Christian religion that came into existence about 300 years ago, now some, some people uh, take it to the Council of Trent, and certainly since the Council of Trent, the church has been focused on doctrine. It's been focused on males, who've been the only ones to do theology. Celibate males at that. Um, and and, and they, the church has been that institution that has known the truth and has had the power to enforce the truth. And if you did not agree with what the church said about the truth, the church would politely kill you. <laughs> it happened over and over and over again. And it's belief-centered Christianity. The kind of community that grew out of the teachings of Jesus was a transformation-centered theology. And that's what we're trying to talk about. Not a belief center, but transformation centered. And yet, ironically, because we have been so steeped in the belief centered uh, paradigm, to talk about transformation centered theology seems heretical <laughs> to people really far out there. So, um, belief centered Christianity came about when uh, Christianity had its encounter with the Enlightenment. That is, when modern science came into existence and scientific ways of knowing came into existence, belief-centered Christianity was a way to rebut these things. It was a way to defend against somebody like Copernicus saying that the earth goes around the sun rather than the other way around. So transformation-centered Christianity is a willingness to embrace the uh, insights from the scientific community and belief-centered Christianity sees religion as a sword to be wielded. Um, Transformation-centered Christianity is a hand extended. Uh, belief-centered Christianity um, is a club. And belief-centered Christianity focuses on a belief that the Bible, Jesus, and Christianity are unique. That is to say, belief-centered Christians hold it that the only way to know God is by the Christian way. Progressive Christians would not hold to that. Jesus and, and the Christian scriptures are the exclusive revelation of God just to those who are Christians. And that means that Christianity is the only way to be saved. Belief-centered Christianity sees that what it means to be saved is going to heaven when you die. And this is what the question, are you saved, means. 
or you're going to heaven when you die. The church where I grew up, Southern Baptist Church in Tennessee, the only reason for being a Christian uh, was to go to heaven when you die. And once you were a Christian, your obligation were to save souls of other people so that they would not go to hell when they died. So what this makes belief-centered Christianity is a religion of requirements and reward. What is required is that you have to believe the right things, and the reward is that you get to go to heaven when you die. Of course, that doesn't really seem fair if some people don't believe, so there has to be a hell for them to go to um, if you don't believe the right stuff. However, even if you believe the right stuff, in belief-centered Christianity, no matter how hard you try, you just can't quite be good enough. You're still a sinner who needs to live with some sense of guilt and fear. Now, you can see what that does to our understanding of Jesus. The primary purpose of Jesus in belief-centered Christianity is not to teach us how to live, not to teach us how to love, not to teach us how to be connected, but how to be correct. And that the sole purpose of Jesus was to die for our sins. So at the very center of this belief-centered Christianity is a view of the Bible. It comes from a God. God inspired it. Some people believe that God actually dictated to those who wrote the scripture word for word. It's a divine product for faith-centered Christianity. It's all about beliefs. This is why when in my youth, I started to question some of what I was taught because it clearly flew in the face of reason. I was told, well, you just got to have faith. Mm -hmm. did, did Jonah really get swallowed by a big fish? That's impossible. Well, you just have to have faith. <laughs> I cannot stress strongly enough. Makes you terrified of swimming. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot stress strongly enough that belief-centered Christianity is a recent phenomenon in the history of religion. Biblical inerrancy as it is currently taught did not gain popularity until the late 1800s. And even as a teenager, it was a puzzle to me why my Protestant church made fun of the Catholics for believing that the Pope was infallible, when in fact my church embraced the infallibility of the Bible, which is nothing but a paper Pope. Hmm. Now, my conviction is that what is called for from us is the work of untying the tangled threads of destiny that bind us. Belief Christianity was, binds us up. And releasing others from the entanglement of the past as well. Now, I want to be clear. This reworking of the tradition is not a watering down of the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus are tough. Read the entire Sermon on the Mount, which is what we're using um, for, these, for these classes. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus describes working to become enlightened and sharing that light with others, seeking reconciliation with others, keeping the commitments we make, meaning what we say and saying what we mean, not retaliating, Loving our enemies, putting God first, measuring ourselves the way we measure others, and treating others the way that we ourselves want to be treated. That's a long list of things that are not easy to do. Mm. Yeah, but our, our beliefs and our behaviors are, are sort of upheld or buoyed by, the, by our cosmologies, by the stories we tell. This is a set of cosmologies, right? Yes. And stories about how we should interact with one another. There's a cosmology, maybe an as-if cosmology with which I am working as I embrace this new story that Jesus dared us to create, that we are again today invited to imagine. Bell Hooks wrote 
If we remain unable to imagine a world where love can be recognized as a unifying principle that can lead us to seek and use power wisely, then we will remain wedded to a culture of domination that requires us again and again to choose power over love. Let's start with another Einsteinian notion. And with this one, I have no quibble. <laughs> Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So what form will our energy take? Will we just shift it from one generation to the next without transforming it, our bodies in the same old ways? Or will we take that energy and reform it, transform it? Which means we need to understand how energy lives and moves and breathes. The conflict or the trespasses between us are as much in our bodies and in our nervous system as they are in our words and deeds. I, I want to share a possible idea for the rewrite of a world where love is a unifying principle. Actually, the very act of going through a process of creativity and imagining is an act of love because love is always transformative, expansive, and as James Baldwin wrote about daring and growth. I had this kind of waking dream or meditation once in which I pulverized old bones in a cave into a whole new galaxy. The end image was of flinging this dust of old bones up into the sky and it glittered there. So bright the darkness could hardly be made out. And I was surrounded by fragile new stars. I was like La Loba, who is a mythical <laughs> kind of archetype, the wolf woman who sung the bones into something new. No one can actually do this alone. We cannot do this work alone. It is community work. And the question becomes then, who is our community? Who is the community with whom we are working and transforming and loving? Who can and will do the work of renewal and reimagining an as-if theology or an as-if world. I want to imagine an economy, for example, that is fair and just and pays its debts. I want to imagine a psychology that heals the trespasses against the body and the mind, and a spirituality that takes us or um, teaches us to take personal responsibility and see others as ourselves. We are tangled up, and the idea is to disentangle without losing the connection. La Loba is a participant in evolution. She's a weaver of stories. She's a cosmologist. What are the stories, again, about us that we want to sing into being? There is a man named Resma Minikim. He's a psychologist and a trauma specialist. He's written a lot about contextualizing racial trauma in the body. His amazing book, My Grandmother's Hands. Have you heard of this book? No. It's part workbook, part memoir, part somatic psychology that addresses white communities, black communities, and police who are a kind of blended community, but all identify as police. He writes that trauma in a person decontextualized looks like personality. Trauma in a family decontextualized looks like shared traits. Trauma in a people decontextualized looks like culture. I want to say that our culture is born of trauma. First, of trauma inflicted, initially upon Native Americans and black Africans. Second, of the trauma retained in those bodies for as many as 14 generations. This research is growing and growing of how long the thumbprint of an experience can stay in a body and be passed down to future generations. Trauma untransformed and reinforced by social systems is retained and passed down. Minikin points out that the trauma inflicted between, let's say, white people in the Middle and Dark Ages, so between white Europeans, torture chamber, chamber and brutality type of trauma, like serious stuff in the medieval times. This was the energy that was brought to America from Europe. So this trauma helped found our current country. 
This was in the body of the colonizers, in the body of who became the Puritans in America. And when we got here, we made up this fiction of whiteness as a way to belong, in a way to reclaim some power over the body and then over other bodies. Traumatized bodies took power and traumatized other bodies. This is the story of America. We brought our trauma with us. This is all knotted up in our nervous system. And, and I really, I encourage you even maybe to listen to this book. He is so wonderful at leading through some of these exercises. But this energy or this history, if it's untransformed, it remains in the body. This is one of our stories, one of our cosmologies, how we created a caste system based on race and class and gender. It deserves our respect and attention. Immediately, so many of us, he talks about this, this initial response of becoming defended or braced when we hear words like race or class or privilege. But Minikim, he says, that's where you start. We lean into that feeling of being braced, into the disturbance. And the disturbance is where we begin to untangle. Think of the Big Bang. It was a disturbance of epic proportions. And look what it made. It made you. It made me. It made this. It made all of us. The world is only getting more complex, more layered, more pluralistic. Complexity is part of the evolutionary process. We can accept it and lean into it, or we can resist it and stay kind of knotted up or braced, if you will. Imagine a world where love can be recognized as a unifying principle, not trauma, not brutality, not othering, but love. People who want this world need to work as if this world is possible. So what if it's not actually? I, I have no idea what the outcome will be, but what have we got to lose by living more intentionally with love and creativity? I say nothing. Pascal made the wager that you better believe in God so that you can avoid eternal damnation. It's a very passive wager, but let's take it one step further. What do we believe about our belief in God? What does it command of us? The activity of love is a wager I'm willing to make. It demands something of me. This is how we move through our trespasses, by leaning into the disturbance and toward creation. I know I keep referencing this turning point, but after 9-11, things changed for all of us. I switched in my focus in teaching from depth psychology to, um, although I still embrace it personally and professionally and use it, but I, I switched to being militantly anti-fundamentalist. Funda fundamentalism has spewed such toxicity into our world and culture, and because of it, we suffer from a slew of diseases. Irony deficiency, truth decay, electile dysfunction. What? My spell check changed to that. I I'm know just going to say. <laughs> and what I'm calling spiritual attention deficit disorder. Steve Berman, who lives in Austin and is a comic who goes by the name of Swami Beyondananda, says that what we need is not an uprising, but an upwising. He writes, Imagine think tanks where they think about something other than tanks, and young people get to live for their country instead of dying for their country. Imagine government of, by, and for the people where the government does the people's bidding and not the bidding of the highest bidder. Imagine achieving true minority rights where each of us has the inalienable right to be ourselves, an indivisible minority of one, each of us one of a kind, just like everybody else. Imagine we the people coming to a commonly sensed, uncommonly sensible consensus that we would rather live by the golden rule than die by the rule of gold, end of quote. I, I know it's crazy to propose a sane world, but I am inviting you to commit yourself to creating a sane asylum where we make fake news irrelevant by creating some real news. 
That's the meaning of the word gospel. Good news. Let's go for heaven on earth and have a hell of a time doing it. <laughs> There's a lot of darkness in this world. Jesus says, be the light. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step and we'll see you here next week.